Every character in this book has a motivation or a hidden motivation that we don't know about yet. He's a fantastic plotter. Th this oh, book, yeah. Highly, highly recommend this book. I have not found a book, Rich. Even, even better. No, Rich, I have <laughs> not found a book that sparked <laughs> me like this in a long time. You've had me reading Wheel of Time bullshit. I'm sorry. I just have to throw a dick. <laughs> we always got it. Just, we just once. Just once. I know it gets for cliche, but still, I have not had that spark again. And I have the spark. I can thank this man because this book brought back the... This is why I love fantasy. This is why I love books. <laughs> thank you sincerely. You let me escape. You let me forget. I love this book. Welcome back, everybody, to the Tudor Ramble episode. I am one of your hosts, Austin. And I'm your other host, Richard. And we... Together, you can join me, Rich. Yep. We, we love, love it. this book. Woo! I love it a little bit more. A little bit more. I love it a little bit more. But I love it quite a bit. This is a fun, fun book. Uh, it is, we're going to go 10 to 15 minutes of spoiler-free first for The Will of the Many. Then we'll get into spoilers. We will warn everybody. It has been months and months and months since I have found a book that has reinvigorated my spark and love for reading. And I can thank James. Is it Islington or Islington? I've I heard. believe it's Islington. Islington. But I could very well be wrong. I can thank this man because this book brought back... The, this is why I love fantasy. This is why I love books. <laughs> thank you. Sincerely, you let me escape. You let me forget. I love this book. Um, FYI, before Austin read this book, I told him, Hey, by the way, this book is fantasy version of Red Rising. Do with that what you will. I was very accurate in that you, I knew you were going to love this book. And I hope even people that weren't the biggest fan of Red Rising, this allows for some people to also like this oh, book. Oh, no, yeah. This, this, this has a builds. wider audience. It, I completely agree. We're going to talk We're gonna talk about yeah. that, but like, it does, it captures that thing that Red Rising really does well. A, a bunch of story tropes that it does, and I think it builds on it and makes it a bit more a bit more juicy juicy yeah the plot is a bit more juicy than red rising it's it's way more complex it yeah. there's a lot more moving parts <laughs> it feels more epic in a way mm -hmm. where th this you the reason you say it's like red rising is if you're going in to read this book and you're trying to be convinced it is roman inspired there's a lot of roman shit there's roman, roman stuff. so if you don't like rome for some weird reason rome's cool rome is cool rich you know Rome's cool. I mean, how often do you think about the fall of the Roman Empire? I just think this is literally my Roman Empire. Yeah. M my Roman Empire is the will of the many See, now. I don't think about the fall of the Roman Empire. I think about the, the rise, rise of the new Roman Empire. When Julius Caesar <laughs> destroyed democracy. Ah, <laughs> uh, a great day. A great day in history. Mm, and this a book has a lot day. to say about democracy. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This book does say democracy is cringe. Mm. Quoted. 100%. <laughs> Go it. Prove me wrong. Go find it. Go read the book and, and prove find me out. wrong. This has it's very Roman inspired and there's elements of uh, the trope is an academia trope. So yeah. fantasy academia. Think Hogwarts. Right. Basically. I think Hogwarts with a very more epic scaled fantasy book, Roman inspired and could you add another layer onto that of what else What else could you give with it being spoiler-free? What, what could they expect going in? A lot of um, playing multiple sides. You have a main character that is basically, ha because they are hiding their identity, they have to pretend to be one person in one situation and another somewhere else. Multiple factions Ooh. pulling at them. Exactly. The kind of like a little bit um, Lies of Locke Lamora of having to play every side little bit of that while basically trying to play for your own team mm -hmm. it, it has that though secret royalty secret air kind of trope yeah where this our main character has this his, is chapter one chapter stuff. one yeah spoiler free and like this is your intro to the book is this is our main character and his father his family and old kingdom all dead all killed off right from the get-go and our main character this doesn't want to fight back the kingdom and the hi the hierarchy, the system that killed his family because the revolt, the people going against and avenging his family is just as bad as yeah. the system because both the 
the ones rising up and trying to fight the system and the system itself are both immoral and there's both problems. So our main character, Vis, just wants to get the fuck out. He wants to leave. And it's such a compelling way to have a main character who is passive. And yeah. you see where that goes and is layered throughout the book where people are pulling at him. And there's so every character in this book has a motivation or a hidden motivation that we don't know about yet. He does a great job. He's a fantastic plotter. Th- this oh, book, yeah. Hi- highly, highly recommend this book. I have not found a book, Rich. Even even better. No, Rich, I have <laughs> not found a book that sparked <laughs> me like this in a long time. You've had me reading real time bullshit. I'm sorry. I just have to throw a thing. <laughs> we always got it. Just, we, just once. Just once. I know it gets for cliche, but still, I have not had that spark again, and I have the spark. I'm so happy. I'm sparked. I, I'm sad that Dungeon Crawler Carl didn't spark you as well. But, I, you know, no, I really enjoy that. It's a nice comfort read, but it doesn't you know? The spark is different than fun. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> were you gonna say something before I got all into myself? Yeah, go ahead. I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Well, basically, the the will of the many. Why I have a lot of trust in it. So, book one for me is a great introduction, great book one. However, I have read his previous series, uh, the Lycanus trilogy, book three being one of like top tier books, one of the best plots I've ever read. It was such a fantastic conclusion where I trust this man. I know he can plot a damn good story and Mm. that all the pieces are going to come together in a very satisfying way. In, and most of the people, like, you catch some things of where they're going to go, but there's enough twists in there that you won't see coming that it's so satisfying. And that was I his first it. trilogy, Lacanus trilogy. Exactly. Which you'd say his first couple, the first book in that series, not the best, right? First but book's a little rough. It gets better. And by Second end- book's better. Third book is amazing. And so because I trust him, I am so excited for the continuation of this series because I know it's going to go somewhere amazing. That's very well put. And you'd say his book one here compared to his book one of Lacanus trilogy. Way better. Significantly better. Oh, way better. He has improved though? great. Like you can tell. That's awesome. He he just he learned book to book of mm-hmm. his prose vastly improves dialogue. I think that was his biggest problem in Lacanus trilogy is the mostly the prose and the characters mm-hmm. were a little weak. Or the and character, it's much stronger here. Oh, way stronger. He, yeah. he has very good prose in this book. I'm Really impressed. Awesome. And we are not the only ones to say this. If you don't want to just listen to us, I found Patrick Leo, fantastic booktuber, and Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews, who's on the channel, fantastic book reviewer. Both give this a five out of five stars, if that tells you anything. They love this book. And I, I was looking at the reviews. They were gushing about this so much. This was came out in 2023. It's a relatively yeah. new book. And the second... It will be a trilogy, I believe. And the second book in this hierarchy series is what it's called, is coming out 24 or 25 looks like probably 25 it yeah. looks it looks like the plan originally was going to be around december 2024 but then god Sander- emperor sanderson god emperor sanderson decided to release uh stormlight 5 then so no books competing with stormlight 5 nobody wants to compete yeah. with stormlight 5 so it, they're yeah i think he's pushing it back a month or two definitely like that and we talked about this book in our monthly book club on our Patreon in our Discord. Link in the description below. We were talking if you, with... If you want to talk with us in exclusive Discord where we chat about books, we have our book clubs. It's a ton of fun. Check it out. And when we were chatting with everybody, we had a lot of love for this book. And Nace loved it just as much as I did. I had I had an ally. And you too. <laughs> just, you know. I... You like it. We are allies. But in this we, are, book. we are complete allies. Good. Yes. I love this book. It's great. Energy. Let's go. And then Jai said I also love the book. Avery really enjoyed the book. We had Beatrice liked it, but then we had one naysayer, Levy. Shame on you, Levy. Levy doesn't like books. Levy just Levy's a le- Levy down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Okay, and also, if you want to check out, if we convinced you or you'd want to read this book, we have an affiliate link in the description below if you want to also support us while getting the book at the same time. We'll always have affiliate links down there now. Helps out. Yep. So that is, more. before we get into spoiler stuff, mm-hmm. we need to get into our spoiler-free rating sure, for we, this book. I'll go first. Yes, please. Overall, with our the official Richard Rambler rating, I gave a 4.25. Meaning, I think it was really great. That that's my rating. 
you know what? I was going to complain, but you put a lot of emphasis in this is really great, and I appreciate how much energy you put into that. Okay. Because you could have said 4.25. It's really great. Th- those no. are two different ratings. If you no, say no, it's a 4.25, no, it's no. really great. I'm sticking to my rating system. Yes. We, we figured it out. Precisely. See, really great. That tone is, is good. Re- good. Yes, that's a 3.5. That's a 3.5 mm-hmm. tone. Mm-hmm. Really good. That's really good. Then I got a <laughs> really great. That's really great. See, I'm I'm getting it. Good. I'm, I'm gonna have right to tone. put a fire under my ass because of the rating I gave this. Okay, I gave this a four point five out of five stars, meaning this was spe- okay. <laughs> spectacular. I loved this book so much. I enjoyed my time. We're we're, yeah. we're nearly there. I love this book. Okay, to keep spoiler free of why you love this book so much, why it was really great for you, mm-hmm. what do you think the best category or categories were, or the best elements, and then maybe what some of the worst ones were? Uh, the best was plot. I think, for me, I think it's pretty obvious that the plot was spectacular. Other than that, I'd say emotional impact is definitely up there because he get gets you with those twists and turns. There's some real emotional moments surprising moments that kind of threw me off guard like i i had a couple moments where i was out loud like wow what the hell happened there right so that and i think the thought provokingness i think it has something to say and more so it's a good introduction i'm looking forward to the questions it poses and how it will be answered later in the series very fair but it does it does posit some interesting questions. Very fair. Yeah, I would say for this book, plot is the best part about it. If you're looking for, a, if you're a plot reader, you'll love this. I would describe this book as the opposite of Dune's plot, where in Dune, <laughs> every single character, you know exactly what every character's think because Frank Herbert brings you into their mind and basically says, well, this character's killing everybody. Okay. <laughs> so th- nothing's hidden. We know what every character thinks in the will of the many. We, it's a first person point of view from this and you have nothing on any of the characters and they all have hidden motivations and barely even this, b- not even this. That's <laughs> one. We don't even know what this is. <laughs> so that is, it, I'd say opposite of doing that regard. Fantastic plot. The lower category, I mean, it's n- not doing anything crazy with pros. It's good pros, but that's yeah. nothing else great. I think all the other categories just spectacular. So we, we got to get into spoilers, Rich. Yep. You ready? Time to tune off if you haven't read the book already or you don't care about spoilers, the monster you are. So we will give, we're on. We're doing our best to give context for, for those who continue on if you do listen and don't care about spoilers. So we'll try to give context in the scenes. Yeah. Go from there. Spoiler warning. We're going. You ready, Rich? Okay, first category, emotional impact. What did you give this out of five stars? I gave it a four out of ten. I thought it was great. Four out of ten? Sorry, four out of ten. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) uh, (laughs) That would have been a little ironic. (laughs) I gave it a (laughs) a 4.5 out of five. Spectacular. Love this. Uh, Really emotionally connected. Why the four? We can now get spoilery about it. So basically saying what we were before, but get more detail. Why, Why the four? What moments hit for you? So oh, there, also, what emotion did you feel? What was it going for, and why did it hit that way? Sure. Um, I think mostly it was going for a lot of shock moments. There are plenty of scenes set up where to big twists. I think probably one of the most surprising scenes was the Coliseum massacre scene. That was definitely the one that threw me for a loop the most. And by the way, this is in part one. This is book. part one, and you start reading like <laughs> of a three part book. The mass. <laughs> Viz going into the Coliseum going like, okay, I'm going to have to meet with uh, this other person secretly. I'm going to figure out a way to get out of this cute meeting and meet this terrorist lady. Okay. Terrorist <laughs> lady? What a kind way to call a terrorist. <laughs> terrorist She's lady. the terrorist darling. <laughs> <laughs> and then goes, goes meets with the terrorist, and then goes sits back down in their seat, and that same terrorist group starts massacring thousands of thousands of people traps them use some weird magic system and starts wiping the entire audience of the coliseum out and viz basically having to escape then goes back and uses a device that the terrorist gave him to actually kill the lead terrorist mm-hmm. his old friend and then becomes one of the heroes of the empire 
Oh boy. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is this was a scene that is the end of several books. Yeah. Like this this is a climax for many books, and this was the end of part one. Mm-hmm. No, I think there's some more chapters in part one. It was like the toward the end of yeah, part toward one. Toward the end. <laughs> and the way you just put it where then he was the hero of the empire. That what's so the tension and you feel in the the mystery of this book, a couple things that, that emotionally pulled me really well was after that Coliseum scene, and for the rest of the book, you see, okay. The citizens love him because he saved the day. The military in this world kind of need to use him to figure out, wait, what'd you just figure out about this, how they kill that many people? And they see him as they're, a little, little bit of a threat. They're mistrustful. They're mistrustful very much. And then the terrorist group, the heads of the terrorist group. So you're Osama bin Laden. I've used this when we were talking to the patron book club. I was like, okay, imagine this. You're Osama bin Laden loves you because they're using you against the empire. But the terrorists, all of Al-Qaeda... All of okay, below Osama hates you because they saw you kill their leader. So the head of the terrorist group is using you. The and likes you. And somewhat. likes you somewhat. And the rest of the cannon fodder hates you and is trying to kill you. The military is all these pressures that's put on him. And then at the same time, you have Ulusor, uh, his the mentor character that you'd put, kind of yeah. put in this place, who's using him to get back at revenge for his brother's the, death. Yeah, and so he's being pulled in all these directions, and you get unfold the both the two main things this does emotionally for me is one, it unveils the motivations behind everybody, and two, exactly what you said with the Coliseum scene is it constantly increases the stake of the story. At first, you think it's a story about okay. Uh, avenging the avenging oh finding out the mystery about Ulser's dead brother did he commit suicide yeah what's going on there and then the next layers wait a second no this is about a whole revolution that's going on between the old and the new and old, then it builds oh no now it's it's not about a revolution it's actually about this apocalyptic apocalyptic event through the magic system of whatever you have here. the cataclysm the cataclysm like holy shit <laughs> so all this is going on it's just incredibly done and that coliseum scene for you hit the most did any other part after that did it connect super well for you? Or was that the was that the peak of the book for you? It may have been the peak, but some other scenes came close that I, I was really into it, especially the the surprising scene of Viz coming up with the plan to get back to the um school early that he's on vacation and he has to come up yeah. with some plan to investigate this uh ruins area uh for his adoptive father and basically Pace his adoptive father saying, like, hey, if you don't, I'm gonna uh basically gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Figure it out. And he's like, but I don't know how. They they, they lock that place down tight when their school is like, figure it out. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> and so he goes poke. poke the bear. <laughs> and so he figures out a way to like he sneaks back into the school during the vacation mm -hmm. and then sneaks back out, then comes back again. A really cool infiltration scene and shows how pressed against the wall he is. Brain uses those terror vest things, whatever those were. Probably called. our most direct connection with Viz using the magic system. Yes. Because he's very much removed from all of the magic because he morally mm -hmm. objects to the use of using other people's will as a power source. Yes. Which I thought was fascinating the way to yeah. present it. Yeah, I love that scene. And for me, the the push and pull of this book where in that in that scene where you think he's oh is he going to make it out kind of that tension what he does really well in those other scenes are a small mini example of this is with him and his buddy eden e-i-d-h-i-n i think is how it was in the book but him and his buddy the guy he punched at first in the book so him and his buddy here well before they were buddies they were going on their arc of becoming friends and they have to do this labyrinth together they have to solve this maze and just a way of how he James Islington, Islington emotionally plays with you as he sets up the Labyrinth games and he has our main character, Vis, go into the Labyrinth with all the classmates watching around and we're watching our pro-tag, pro-tag and he does better than others because, hey, no joke, our, well, when we get in the characters, well, we'll talk about Vis, yeah. uh, but he goes, gets two-thirds the way but fails. Oh, he didn't make it. But then he gets out and his partner, Eden, has to go through the maze and Vis is helping him by changing this things in the maze, changing the walls to help him and block from the hunters getting him. And so they, the way that happens for those who didn't read the book is they, they know the same language that other people don't 
it's it's not common tongue language, but they share the same language. So they're able to cooperate without other people hearing their plan. Exactly. So they beat the labyrinth the first time trying without any of the other students doing so. So it was like a huge surprise. And then they are about to celebrate their victory. But then the professor goes, well, you use a different language. That's cheating. So it's a smaller example of how he gives you oh, a loss. He didn't win. Oh, we did win. Oh, but didn't win. But then but you make a baby step to toward... He made a friend. Exactly. Now they uh, they each have something in common. Yes. And a little gives each of them a piece of home and a reminder that they're not alone in this foreign hostile empire. Exactly. And, and but that... we're we're talking a lot about the plot for emotional impact. Overall, that does summarize a lot of this. Uh, like How we a feel lot, about. a lot of what I feel about it. Because the characters, I think, are good, but not amazing. Like I, I like Viz. Oh, we can get in the character section, but yeah, sure. we'll do. Th- can I just want to mention one more thing with emotion? Sure. Because the one when a book gets me to shout out loud. Ah, uh, where did you shout out loud? Yeah, like I, I, I shouted out loud. I am such a simpleton when it comes to these dark academia, like powerful protagonist types, where. He is fighting, I believe his name was Indoor. He was fighting him in the battle when he was in class six to go on to class five. He was fighting that kid who was seen as like the best duelist. And we have Viz going to fight him. And I won't say another series that does this. One of my favorite series that you mm-hmm. kind of see where in the duel, the, he's, he's the underdog. He's supposed to lose against this guy, but he's actually winning. Turns out his opponent, the other kid who's supposed to win, is cheating. So now you're, I'm sitting there all frustrated, like he's cheating. That's not fair. That's not fair. And then our main character, Vis, oh. after he figures out he's cheating, he just says, fuck this. And he basically just rampages his head and goes, bam, 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 <laughs> till he bleeds and dies, and dies. And he doesn't actually die, but chills. So our main character just does this, goes to the professor who's helping the kid cheat, and just says, I'll be accepting my upgrade to the next class now, bitch. <laughs> and then walks away. Just that adrenaline rush. It's so cathartic. And I love it. I For over a year, I've been trying to get you to read Rage of Dragons. Oh, I will love that That's book. That's the entire <laughs> book. The entire book is that. That's all it is. I know what my next read is. <laughs> it's the entire book. I love that like, shit. It's, it's literally fight to fight of like underdog protagonists going against other guy who's like cheating. And you're like, no, we're just like, yeah, get him. It's okay, great. I'm going to give that it's a five. the entire book. I'm going to love that. The whole thing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm now so excited. <laughs> okay, we, we can go on to thought provokiness. Yeah. I just had to get that out. Thought provokiness, what did you give it out of five stars? I was thoroughly surprised. I gave it a 3.75. So I thought this actually was really good. This had, I'm not giving it higher because kind of it planted the seeds and I'm waiting for it to kind of blossom later down in the series. Yeah, I'm, I could change this. I could be convinced to lower this and change it in retrospect to the series. It just really impressed me. I gave this a 4.5. Oh, wow. With a spectacular thought provoking this because after our book club discussion, I swear I'm not saying book club just to get you guys to join it constantly. <laughs> it's just we had a really long discussion about this book. How <laughs> long was Was that like four was, hours? No, three. It three, was like three hours. Because we, reco- we recorded, but then also had the, uh, like, we talked after and before. I think it was roughly oh, okay. three hours. But the more we talked about with other people, like, I had it lower at first. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm thinking more about the book, it's sticking with me. And bear in mind, I finished this a couple days ago, so the thought-provokingness is something that is more likely to change over time because you'll think back to what books actually stick with you. Sure. But why did you give it very good? What impressed you about it? Because it, I'll clearly agree with what you're about to say if you have good things to say. So, The chief, uh, the chief point that I think this book is trying to get you to think about is in an oppressive regime, how culpable are the average citizens of it so the they're not the leaders they're just the regular people but from the occupied point of view is that the oppressors are only able to have their power by the common people supporting them and so they are just as culpable and which ultimately leads to why are the terrorists bad oh i don't know maybe they massacre a bunch of innocent civilians kind of makes it easy on who's the bad guy but 
in this series, it actually is a little bit more direct of the magic systems based where the upper echelon of society literally gains physical, magical power by the lower peasant class giving them their strength, their willpower to the upper class. And so from the terrorist point of view, hey, how do you take the power away from the upper class? You kill their source of power, the peasants. Technically effective. It actually works in the calls. Like the whole Coliseum massacre was not just to kill civilians. Basically, the upper echelon actually felt a huge blow. A lot of the uh, le- the generals and a bunch of people were severely hurt by the backlash of losing like half of their power. They literally fainted or passed yeah. out because they lost their connections in the pyramid. Yeah, and yeah. So that's... that is an interesting question to to posit. Like it's not it's not saying oh maybe it's actually good. It's not what it's saying, but it is showing like what level of responsibility do a group of people have to policing their own society right. so like of course i mean i know i'm making this simple simple point and mm-hmm. like oh talk about nazi germany again it's like how how responsible are the uh german civilians that lived around auschwitz how responsible are they for auschwitz and concentration camps in general i wouldn't say they're as responsible as say the ss but there is some responsibility of you've done nothing you've said nothing like you see these people going into camps like they know right they how, know what's com- how complicit are you in the atrocity by either turning a blind side or supporting it in a very distant way mm-hmm. because here's here's a modern example we could use of how complicit are we in uh, in child labor factories for having iPhones. Oh, true. Right? Like, take it to yeah. that level of how compl- how removed are you, how close do you get to where you are a culprit of it? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a very interesting question to ask. I, and I think the the better question about this is the terrorists are clear in this book are clearly going too far because obviously they're evil, but they have their their incorrect solution to it is based on a legitimate problem of the people do have some level of responsibility. They are culpable to some degree. Doesn't mean you should kill them all. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It, how much do you get to judge them? How much do you get to judge? And hey, I don't know. Like, I didn't look into the iPhone thing. I don't know if there's actual child labor, like, but whatever that equivalent is. Like Nike had a lot of issues where yeah. Nike was using more ways to get there. So it's how complicit are you, but with how far removed you are, is mm-hmm. ignorance and an excuse? Or in this society, even more specifically, they're not ignorant to it. They are literally bolstering up and participating actively. Now in this. they are forced to participate. That's an additional thing. They're not just willingly. It's it's forced upon them, but well, other yeah. people have refused. Mm-hmm. And like our main character, not, Vis. No, our main character has refused, punished. but severely punished. Mm-hmm. I don't know where the book is going to take this, but I think it's going to be very interesting. I, I do too. That That's one huge thing that just has me thinking about it. doesn't present an answer, but here's the thing. With thought-provoking, <clears throat> with a lot of thought-provoking books will end without giving an answer, but mm-hmm. they'll make you... Th- have a strong way of thinking either way that mm-hmm. either way is, and the way this book end has me going like oh i don't know which way this could go right now and the fact that this is this is like the protagonist in casablanca in many ways where in casablanca rick is and hey it's a 1942 movie i'm gonna spoil it sorry <laughs> <laughs> you, get, the, the, you have the a cutoff tr- date was 20 20- 23 was the cutoff date. Yeah. You get you've, you've have enough, you've had enough. You get what is that 70 something years so in Casablanca the main character Rick is working the, the bar Casablanca or his is it a bar I think it yeah his his bar there's music there and he is staying out of the war between America Nazi Germany staying out of World War 2 and he's just there letting he wants to stay passive. He wants to play Switzerland in a way. And throughout the plot, it's just he's getting pulled in these directions and by the end actually actively goes and quote unquote helps America, like helps the escape of anyways. And Casablanca thing is he ends up deciding in the end, he's not going to stay passive. In this book, this is equally, equally passive of not wanting to choose to 
take over the hierarchy that's do- destroying the system, because he also sees that the terrorist group there is also doing things just as bad. So it's not as simple as Axis versus allies. Mm-hmm. It's Axis versus Axis. And who do you choose? And so the end of this book, at least, with that the message of this, he kind of says, throws up the middle finger to all the religion, the government, the military, Ul- Ulusor, all the people that were pushing all, him. All, the, all of his puppet masters. All the puppet masters. And he says, you know what? Screw you, Geppetto. And he decides to be a censor, just goes the path he wants to, which where is that going to lead book two? I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to pause. Like if they're all the sides are bad, can you forge your own path? I don't know. We'll yep. see. Which it makes him a far more interesting character and where I'm hoping yes. he will go because you want to move into an, anything else for thought provoking this on this one? That, that covered a lot of it. Last thing I had was the, the everybody, the, theme of betrayal and hidden motivation is something that I will look at in future books. And because of this book, I will start to think like, hey, I expect <laughs> I expect more now because this set a standard for me. Mm. So I, that, that's something else I want to put in the, the themes of it. Like, I like that betrayal. Me- that's all. That, that's the last thing I want to mention. Maybe not even betrayal, but everyone has their own motive. Yes. And sometimes those motives can go together or not. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we can go on to characters if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, this kind of wraps into it, talking about Viz. Uh, I gave this a 3.5 out of 5. I thought the characters were good. But okay. Okay. I I would have actually been more neutral if not for all the side characters. Okay. That's the thing. I think the side characters really bolster this where I was most disappointed in Viz. I, I did not have an emotional connection to him nearly at all. To me, it. it the focus of the book is a strong protagonist that is being pulled in multiple directions and cannot figure out his own path. Completely get it. It's not a power progression. It's not about him self-developing in like physically. It's about him developing mentally and actually figuring out the direction he wants to lead his life and to cut the strings of his puppet masters. Completely get that. However... It did s- several times felt a little bit Gary Stewish of something comes up and then haha surprise the secret prince is actually great at everything. It ha- and it's not that it was established that he's great at all these things. It's more of the thing comes up and then he kicks ass and he goes, "Well, actually, I've been studying this because I was a prince." And just like kind of the explanation every time, or it, you're supposed to be shocked if. Oh no, he's going up against the best duelist. Haha, ha, psych. Actually, Viz is the best duelist because he studied as a prince. And like, oh no, he's going up against a great board game chess equivalent master, all this stuff. Well, actually, ha, Viz created the game. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, it just happens to get... <laughs> not where yeah. you start going, I, okay, I get it. <laughs> I disagree, of course. I gave characters a 4.5, a spectacular. Okay. And I will even agree with like the Viz. What, if this was, if I was super in, into Viz, like extremely, it might have been a 5 for me. It's mm-hmm. just, I get the Viz point. We talked about, again, we talked about this a lot in Book Club, but the point on Viz with, uh, when it was going into those situations, whether it was the Foundation game or the fight against Endor and the Duelist, the interesting part for me wasn't like, I knew he was going to accomplish these things. Guaranteed. Like, I knew he was going to get through every step. The cool thing for me was how. So, when he was beating, the when he was winning in the duel, the thing for me wasn't like, oh, he actually won. It was him smashing his helmet and going to him and letting that anger out and just going, fuck you. And seeing how he did that. Or the foundation play. What was cool about the foundation game was how it wasn't just him. It was him giving the deal to her. Saying, hey, I'll give you an out if you go get these documents for my buddy, Caden. Oh, I forget. It's so many names. So many names. Too many names. Uh, Wait, I have it here. Uh, uh, (laughs) Calidus. So get the documents for Calidus. So Belly, he promises, I'll resign the game if you just go get the papers for Calidus. And she does. She comes back with the papers. He says, I'm going to beat you anyways. Basically learning the system of the will of the many of that. That's what they're teaching you to do in this system, in this hierarchy. So I backstab yeah. trail, cl- claw your way to the top. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, for, I could see from your perspective, how this pro tagging, Gary stewing, like good at everything. For me, it's uh, I use this example in the book club too. It's like a Superman character of like, I'm not looking for him to be challenged physically or challenged 
by the foundation game or by the duel. I'm looking for him to go from pass, like you said, passivity into an active character. And what, what's his decision there over the time? And for me, I also, you know, one of those tropes you love, the mm -hmm. retired badass. The retired badass is secretly great at everything because he was the dog back in the day. Like he, he's bringing back his kind of sportiness. Here, here's the thing. With the retired badass, normally it's they're badass at one thing. They're retired from their game. And mm -hmm. they're badass at that thing. If they were badass at everything, like every single, multiple different, the whole idea of a Gary Stu is not that they're good at something, it's that they're better at everything than everyone else around them. That's that's the little bit of the, okay, then why do other characters exist? And it's kind of more frustrating as the surprise. Oh, yeah. Because so, how the story was set up and how the big plot moments were... I have a lot of surprise. It's exciting plot, but when it's solved in the, oh, actually, Viz trained that this as a prince, didn't reveal that until now. That's the more thing. It just disconnects me from the character himself, where it would have been more interesting, solved in different ways. Maybe he used someone else. Like, if he wasn't as skilled in everything, that's just, it, it just kind of disconnects me from the character a bit. I see However, you. The other characters, all their hidden motivations and how they connect with each other, so much fun. Uh, that's what I mean, though. I don't think his Gary Stunis took away from all those other characters because all the side characters were propelled and had their own. Oh, uh, yeah. had they didn't had, take away? They for... stood out. So if oh, yeah. if his if him being good at everything took away from the side characters, I would see that and agree more with like, oh yes, him doing all this good meant you didn't need the side characters, but it didn't draw away, it didn't draw their will in a way. <laughs> Whereas uh, just him, I, it's one of those tropes, just, I was using the retired badass as agreement where, you know how you like to see him come out of show, like actually he's really good at the thing. And good mm -hmm. points, like sure, our Gary Stu here is, he's good at a lot of things. For me, it's that uh, almost the wish fulfillment type of why, more YAS character that you see, like your Percy Jackson is a good example mm -hmm. of this this trope well, of a character where, go ahead i would almost say percy jackson isn't because no, percy yeah. jackson has people like annabeth who is no, better no like a perfect example is son of neptune heroes of olympus where it's that whole trope happens in that book uh, okay where he we've seen him built up for five books of what he's done and then heroes of olympus he comes in and is like nobody knows how badass percy jackson is <laughs> but we know how badass percy jackson it's one of those things yeah. but with yeah with this uh the the I'm not disagreeing with he was good at a lot of things. It's just I that's why I liked this character, and that's why he didn't. Because then we can agree at least on the side characters and having very clear motivations and being necessary to the story. I really don't think this took away from them at all. No, he didn't. So. That's why I thought the characters score overall good. I would say go. I would go neutral or disappointing if it was just grading Viz because mm -hmm. I I just didn't particularly care about his character. Like, I thought it was, his plot is fun, but I didn't like him personally. Gotcha. And there's some moments that are pretty good, but it, I'm looking forward to the next couple of books. I'm sure I'm going to like Viz a lot more. I know it. Mm -hmm. It's just in this book, didn't connect as much with him. You where, thought, is it, easy yeah. to, is it uh, a good way to say you, you thought the author was at least trying to get you to think his struggles were more like he was trying to give you attention of like, Oh, is he, or isn't he going to win the thing? Yes. And that's what you thought it was going for. And you're yeah, like, like, Oh, there I, was multiple plot points okay. where, Oh, how is Viz going to get out of this? And it was, the answer was Viz is already the best. That's right. And that's so where I'm just I, going like, I see what you're saying. Eh. So that's where I disagree with the, how is he going to get out of it? Was the, like the, the way he got out of it and the, the plot point it created, like the foundation game of not just, beating but how it that's what's interesting to me which but, makes it an enjoyable yeah. plot for me yeah but not a very good character but do the, you get what i mean i get of what like, you mean that's but a the, fun plot moment but takes away from my enjoyment of the character it gets gets me to disconnect from him because you you were looking for maybe not looking for the progression of this as character in that way but w cared more about that push and pull than you did about the him being from a passive character to an active character yeah i, I cared Some about it that. by the end Okay. I liked it, but it's just, it's a detractor. It doesn't mean I hate him. Yeah. And I'm saying this at the same time of like, this isn't my favorite protagonist. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed him. 
Yeah. I really enjoyed him. But then the side characters elevate it even more for this book. With like, who was your favorite side character? Calidus. Calidus. Oh, best boy. Best boy. Calidus. Best boy. Calidus. Oh, best so good. boy. Though I will be honest, I think one of the more charming ones, or charming is the wrong word, charismatic was Veritas? the uh, so. no. Terrorist lady. Uh, oh, let me see. It's Relusha. Rul- Rul- her other name starts with an S. There's so many double names. Like this is also Diago. Yeah. So there's many so names. many names. I don't. I don't like it. <laughs> Give me less names. But you, you really liked Relusha, the villain. Me, just she was such an intimidating villain. Cunning. Uh, mainly just cold as ice. Just mm. so many times of seems almost. Almost nurturing in some instances of going like, hey, Diago, we're here with you. We're trying to we're trying to take down the empire that destroyed your family. Come on, work with us. We're going to help you out. And sort of empathize with them. But the minute she gets a, too much pushback, like there's a, just a – there's an invisible line mm-hmm. that Viz can cross. And then she just goes <laughs> – I'll One kill your family. Like, I'll like, ki- whoa. I'll kill ev I'll start killing your friends until you Actually his lie. family's dead, so it would be killing his friends. Yeah, yeah like yeah. hey, you know that friend you just made three days ago? They're gonna die tomorrow if you don't do this. Jesus. It's just like it and she just sounds so resigned to it, like oh yeah. I don't want to do it. You're making me do this. Why are you making me do this? But I will. And yeah. It's cold blooded. Cold blooded. And so I thought she was real uh, intimidating. And real right? intimidating. Yeah, and it's that kind of intimidation where a lot of villains can just be physically intimidating. I won't spoil too much, but in Red Rising, there's a villain that is just has nothing to do with them being stronger. It's just them as a character in person makes you shiver. Yeah, it's those the Homelanders. <laughs> it's oh, I love it. And a, another shout out to a couple characters like Veritas was I, I always thought like oh Veritas. He's something's going on. He's too charming. He, yeah. It seems too superficial. What's he's really the villain, right? But by the end, he kind of gave Jai Sedai, the patron said, Patreon said this, he gives Dumbledore vibes. Doesn't he give some Dumbledore vibes? Oh, yeah, definitely. But also kills kids, kills a lot of kids. S- sends a lot. But here's the thing Dumbledore also sacrificed Harry. Dumbledore's basically saying, like, hey, Harry's he's got to kill Voldemort. <laughs> Who gives a fuck? <laughs> Dumbledore was nice and all, but still was willing to sacrifice Harry. Still, it would be a little different if Dumbledore every single year was like, hey, Voldemort's in the uh, Forbidden Forest. I'm going to send like five students in there every year and see if one of them comes back. (laughs) Not one has come back in like... 10-ish years? Time to use the... (laughs) What's that magic thing they created? The time loop? The time Uh, watch? Take it back. Time watch it. We have plenty of kids. Why? Why do that to save some kids? <laughs> but no, Veritas gave that. He kills two. a lot of kids. Oh yeah, but he, he also gives that charming exterior where I guess you, you think his motive is deeper into. You think his motive is worse than like R- Relusha that we're just talking about. Like yeah, he, villain, villain. But turns his out his motive he, seems to he be ends justify the means is his motive. Where yeah. the ends of he's preventing the cataclysm and sending these kids. And also we don't know the because maybe. The situation with the kids maybe it's like i don't know how it's working with the kids but maybe we'll find out the next book like the kids are coming to him like to save the world like, so who knows it could be it could be less malicious than we think i he don't know could be more honest about the situation maybe he is honest like hey this situation. is a death this you You're could be going into going your die, death but we need to say who knows yeah still not great no 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 but but i imagine it would seems be worse. like it's not much of like he's not doing it for a power play no at least solely a power play he's doing it to try and stop a cataclysmic event right so what did you think about the character like aquia oh i liked aquia it's just or i i i, 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 I you know the character I'm talking oh yeah about. no yeah fun betrayal thinking about <laughs> whose side is she actually on it it's great yeah i i liked seeing her perspective of the the spectacular thing about this book and these characters is every other character had their own story yeah. It wasn't just you know how Vis seemed less important. Like you weren't totally into Vis. Mm-hmm. I could see any of these other characters having their own book. Sure, 
their entire story going on because even Aquia's entire book is the whole time she's she was the person there with this when the Colosseum scene happened. Those who haven't those who haven't read the book, the Colosseum scene where in part one we were talking about earlier, where boom, terrorists destroying tens of thousands of people. This comes kills a terrorist. Well, actually, terrorist kills himself. But essentially, yeah. this looks like this kills a terrorist. So the only other person that was there with him was Aquia. And so Aquia sees this, and Aquia sees him in, uh, it, he sees him Gary stewing, essentially, where he's so good at everything. And that's, why, that's also why I love this, just how good he is at everything, because if he wasn't so good at everything, then there would be no reason for all these people to pull in different directions. It wouldn't make sense for the military to want to pull and use him if he didn't do the Coliseum, or for Ulysor not to want him as this prodigy or for the Academy and Veritas not to see the potential in him. So him him doing this, let even someone like Aqui and shine these side characters where she was thinking reasonably so that, hey, this Gary Stu, he's is, somehow. He's using Will or something. So we think she's suspicious about something else. Like she's figuring out he's from Seuss and his identity. But what really comes to fruition is she thinks he's cheating and using the Will, which you can't blame her. Because by the time that's revealed, she feels so guilty. Like, oh my God, I, I was certain. You, you're literally a god at everything. <laughs> this is impossible. So Aqui is literally you going, stop Gary stewing. <laughs> and then he goes, no. But, and he wasn't even using Will. But just, I, I could literally see a book from her perspective on how she's going to this academy. This crazy guy saves the Coliseum and she's looking into his past and trying to figure out, oh, who's he connected? Is he using Will? And then comes to her fruition. But every character has their own thing going on. Veritas, this whole thing with the cataclysm. Ulysor, who I loved, the one thing I loved about Ulysor is he's one note, and that might be bad for some people when you hear one note, but he is obsessed, obsessed over his brother's death. Mm -hmm. And when you see what that obsession does to him to the point of, at first he seems like he's doing, at first his motivation seems like he's doing this for the military and religion have these conflicts. Yeah, he's kind of hiding it at first, but then more and more as you see the obsession, how deep it is of him talking with his parents, of when Vis walks back into the room and like it's it's uh, this is the topic they're talking about of it, his parents are saying let it go. He's been dead for six years. He it was a suicide. Like it was not a, it was not a conspiracy, Richard. It wasn't. Not everything is a conspiracy. But what if it is? <laughs> <laughs> I. I re I listened to a podcast about it. And they <gasps> said, <laughs> the, 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 the frogs <laughs> turning the freaking frogs gay. The frog. <laughs> so I just loved. I I couldn't not love the character so much because it is so difficult for a book to go like each one has their own story. That's incredible. Each one has their own motivation and story. I could see this being written from all of them, and that's got to say something. And, and the the bro ship between Eden and Cassidus and this. And just, oh, lovely. And Amissa, the relationship between Amissa, you understand why Amissa loves, uh, why she likes, she why like. she likes this because, oh, this guy who saved the Coliseum. Let's see. Uh, Tall, attractive, national hero that saved tens of thousands of lives. Good at just about everything. Charming to talk to, apparently, and funny. Man, I, I can't think of a reason why she exactly. would be romantically interested in him. <laughs> I could name things for Richard. He has a podcast. Got a podcast. He's got a stable job. That is true. He's going to the gym a lot. You're, you're getting into shape. Better. And you're looking good from the past. And thanks, bud. <laughs> that's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> and now why you shouldn't. Now what? <laughs> hey, was a negative. I had no hair. I'm growing more hair. Ah, so that you know, hey, get in early. And he's a great Before cuddler. You, uh, what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I love these characters. Yeah, love them. Do you want to go on the plot? I do. Okay, plot. What did you give plot out of five stars? I give it a four point two five. A really great plot. I gave it a four point really? seven five. Nearly floored me. Freaking really spectacular plot. Goblinly gook. I loved it. <laughs> There's several moments in so. It's it's really strange that I kind of have a interesting mix because there are some moments in the plot that I think did floor me, mm. but then there are other sections that I was a little disconnected or just not as interested in. Okay, and so it was a weird mix. And then because several times where I was not as interested, I felt like it was a plot point ripped from a different book, and it felt a little jarring. Of 
how and I was just reminded of how similar it was to other things. It was done its own way. It's not. Oh, like can I give an example? Bad. Maybe you, why I didn't give yeah, it the five is it the dog scene? <laughs> That's one of them. It's the, the dog at the end is like that. Dog saves him. The wolf. That wolf saves him a lot. <laughs> it saved him once. Yeah. Twice. <laughs> Twice. But yet yeah, that was a uh, assassin's apprentice moment, and plenty of other scenes, like plenty of other books, do the same thing. But we did say before, plot was the best category, and we're starting to dig on the plot. What is that? All I know. About? Here's the thing. Yeah. Those are a. That's I'm it. giving that 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 slight detractor of why I'm not giving it a five, mm-hmm. because the positives are real great. Mm-hmm. I. That's the thing. I had several moments just like you. I was mocking a little bit, but I was also cheering with. Oh yeah. With Viz was beating that oh, yeah. uh, that bully's head into the ground that yeah. dropped the faulty. Uh, helmet uh-huh. at the corrupt teacher's oh. feet. It's like, oh, you may want to check that uh, equipment again. I think it's a little broken. Then goes off. It's mm-hmm. great. No, I was I was cheering with you. It was great. Okay, good. great moments. Okay, so I had plenty of those fun, exciting moments. I I thought just how it was woven together of like me trying to piece together the mystery elements of, yeah. hey, what is this magic system? What do these ruins mean? What is this cataclysm that kind of all these different sides are kind of hinting at? And some connection to. Great how it all comes together. Love the maze. Wonderful. All that's great. And then, of course, epilogue. Jesus. If we're talking about plot. Jesus. Oh, Lord. Like, you you end the book. And you go, oh, what an interesting end to the book. I'm, I'm excited to see how uh, Viz, the censor, is going to do. Mm-hmm. Like that, okay, he lost an arm. But you know what? He's going to try and cover up his past. He's going to figure out this mystery. He's going to... Cool. Excited to see where that goes. Then epilogue starts and going, hey, this is like the last chapter. This feels like we're repeating something. Am I reading like a mistake? No. Alternate dimension going on. So now we have a parallel dimension Mm -hmm. fizz. And you go... That's a weird. That's a weird epilogue. Now I'm really curious. And then third, <laughs> third ending with another parallel dimension comes something completely different. Crazy happens, and now we at left at the end of the book. Of wait a minute, we have three main character visits now in alternate dimensions that they're all going to have their own plot points and their whole stories. What? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> and we know carriers alive. The brothers alive in this other dimension. No, James. Le- when it comes to epilogues, he's the king of epilogues, the absolute king. Book three uh, of Lacanus of Lacanus is the best epilogue ever read. Period. Ever written. Ever, ever written. written. Ever, ever written. written. Best epilogue. This man can cook. He can't cook an epilogue. Mm. He knows. Okay. I'm knows more excited than the for the epilogue than the epilogue. <laughs> Just skip to the epilogue. Just right? skip to the epilogue. It's so, going to be so, more exciting. So people do that. Oh, oh God. Blasphemy. But this this ended at such a... So three visits. Yeah. And you, you had a great prediction. You have a very interesting way you think that's going to go. Do you want to say that? Yeah. I think... They're each... Each PO... We're going to get in the next book. This is my theory. That... We're going to follow all three POVs of Viz in a different dimension, timeline, alternate version. And each of them is kind of going to explore a different aspect of this world. I think the first Viz, the one that lost an arm, is not really going to go into the combat. He's not. He's now going to be a lot less physically active, so we're not going to get the action from him. But we're going to get the political intrigue of him trying to weave his way through the Empire the political system, hiding his identity, trying to remove records or plant a fake record of himself, and just him figuring out all the different angles and avoiding the all of the puppet masters that he's cut off. Right. We're going to get that political intrigue. Then we have one that's with the brother of, what's his name? Ulasor. U- Ulasor. We're probably going to get some magic. So a lot more connected to the base level magic. There's a hidden magic system we know that I don't think it's directly connected to will so i think we're going to see something there that we're going to get i have no idea what the the middle one is 
what kind of plot, but I imagine we're going to get different plot directions for each of them. And then toward the end of that book or beginning of the third book, all three versions of Viz are going to merge back into one character. And so we're going to have like superpower Viz of he's learned the magic from one dimension. He's gained the political intrigue and, you know, learned these other things of the system. It, we're just going to have a, an amalgamation super Viz by the end of the third. Super Viz. <laughs> That's my. That's my. I guess. think it was Kendall that added on to that, saying in each of the dimensions he could be in the religion in one, government the other, and military the other. Kind of yeah. exploring each of those aspects that are very clearly set up in this book. Yeah. And Ooh. thing is, it's going to be cool to see a character that we had a whole book with them, and we know his personality, we know his character, and then we're going to go into book two, and see how that character diverges. Like, how does the same person? change over different oh, fascinating uh different plot points in his life so like by the end of book two are we gonna have basically have three different characters that oh. the events in their life has drastically changed them right. and how their personality is going to be different right i find that that's going to be so cool to read that's gonna be so cool it, it ends on a point where i'm almost upset i read this now mm -hmm. because you want it's one of those epilogues you start the next book right away. oh yeah you start <laughs> That's it. And the, we talked a lot about plot. We we're going spoiler free too, because mm -hmm. this is this is the whole point of this book of what will make you love this or not. Why you probably gave it the four two five overall as a book. Mm -hmm. It's the plot carried it with just even if there was less interesting points, it always threw you for a loop. There was always another stake to be added. There's always another motivation you didn't see coming. And why we were compar comparing it at first, that Red Rising. Another good comparison to give to it is that not only is it the Roman theme, not only is it your uh, main character, the anger, uh, mm -hmm. has that anger, but also it's written in, written in first person point of view, present tense, I believe. Yeah, first yeah. person present tense, just like Red Rising is, and where Red Rising has that more guttural, fast pacedness to it, this kind of throws you in for those jarring cuts, and yeah, and it's sudden like stop start type deal. Like, yeah, kind of goes along. It's not super fast, but then all of a sudden, drop of a hat, super reveal super big reveal big action moment super fast pace and then slows down and out mm -hmm. so it's not just you know constant action right it's it's but woven it's surprising in. yes woven in so that you can build up you can build up assumptions of where you think these characters are going and what you think is going to happen and then coliseum happens oh no and frequently and also he yeah. writes he writes the plot in a way where you think you know where it's going to go and then the character does the opposite several times in the story like it's almost he builds up the trope and sets it up going like yeah you've read this story before and then he does something else and that's pretty fun like, yeah. the first one was where terrorist lady comes yeah. in and you think oh it basically sabotages the balloon that they're riding on and plans to take him away and he she reveals that he knows who he tr truly is and it's like hey you're not ready for this academy. I'm going to train you personally, get you ready. And, you know, a little training arc here first. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to ransom you back. And then you're going to go to the academy. It's going to be Gucci. We're going to be good. Mm -hmm. And he goes, and so you, you as the reader kind of go, oh, okay, that's exciting. A little training arc here before they're, fair enough. And it, it really does seem like he's going to go with her. And then he just says no. It's like, uh... I don't want to do that. I'm going to go with this other guy. But that's <laughs> why that subversion works so perfectly, Rich, and why I love this plot. The, the subversion, a subversion works if it's actually a logical way to subvert it. Because you can't mm -hmm. just subvert and go, hey, I was going to cook you eggs, but instead I gave you spaghetti. Like, whoa, I was putting eggs into my mouth and I just got spaghetti texture. Spaghetti's good, but you did not build up to spaghetti. <laughs> That kind of works Perfect as an analogy. analogy. I think so. Not, I'm using that again. I'm writing a book called The Egg to Spaghetti Theory. It teeters my totter. That's all I'm saying. It's a, it's a good balance. The eggs and spaghetti being opposites. They. By the way, I was told before this video that we need to segue it in there. I couldn't figure out a way. But buy Teeter My Totter merch. We have t-shirts and things. I did not tell you to say that, but you thank did. you. But no, I didn't. <laughs> he did. I said, Rich, you got to plug our merch. We're not selling enough t-shirts. <laughs> I don't know if they'll believe you right now. I hope they do. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> 
Thank you, though. <laughs> By Teeter Matata over the dem- Democracy is Cringe, though. This is the whole book is about Democracy is Cringe. So I get it. If this episode yeah. you get those t shirts, makes sense. <laughs> I was, I'm going to do that to you in future episodes. Richard made me plug his shirts. That was, that was smart. <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, eggs to spaghetti. No, you can sub- forget about that the one. subversion. On. No, I'm holding on to that. Literally, let me cook. Okay, so the the whole subversion of expectations of this is set up as this passive character who doesn't want to choose it and pick a side. Mm-hmm. And so when that subversion comes, of you expect, oh, he's gonna go down the arc because I've seen this story happen that this many times go down this way where it's the joins the revolutionary group. Asa. No, it goes back to training arc or going back to his Ulisser. and you go. Whoa, didn't expect that. But also, oh, that goes right in line with what he should do. It doesn't, yeah. it, it makes, it, it, the subversion works when it tricks you for a moment and thinking, hey, look, here's this crown jewel over here, but really it's been on this path the whole time. So it looks, it's mm-hmm. such a genius way of plotting this out. Uh, it's so, so good and so smart of how he does this. Because then when you get to a subversion, uh, it subverts, but also stays with the tropes a lot. Where this is a pure dark, ac- it's an academia. Mm-hmm. You've also seen stories like this, but it seems new and fresh enough to where you can get the people that enjoy the trope so much, but also, oh, this is new and fresh and exciting. When Patrick Leo was reviewing this, he said it was the best academia book since Name of the Wind, which... That's un- a low bar. Unfortunately, you That's don't like Name of the Wind, low bar. but coming from Patrick, it's a high bar. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're going to have to debate him after. Oh, after I read the book, we should have him on to discuss that book. That would be cool. And, that, and Mike, because Mike doesn't like it, so we could have two on ooh, two. Ooh, a little two on oh. two. You're assuming you're going to like it? I'm going to force myself to like it. Oh, uh, okay. Because I have to for content. <laughs> I, I have to, because if I don't like it, then the thing there's is, no push and pull. I feel like I. I ooh. Hmm. Honest, learn things about you from this book. You may like it more than me. Mm. Maybe. I'm pretty sure you won't like it. Pretty sure. You think I'll give it but like a, a two five? It's my guess. Okay. Mainly because of that ending. Okay. It's it's such a disappointing ending. No, not spoiling anything, of course. Yeah. yeah, I'm not spoiling anything, but that was most of my okay. anger was okay. the ending. Okay. Fair I enough. actually didn't hate my time while reading it. <laughs> I was just kind of expecting stuff and then realizing that's the end of the book. That's it. I hate you. <laughs> Watch. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. That's gonna yeah. be that's gonna be a fun time. But it th- it was he's he's a tease is what I'm saying. He teased me enough and then just never delivered. And I got blue balls at the end of that book. I hated it. Well, you and Mike versus me and Patrick. Patrick yeah. and I. We're just assuming they'll come on. We're like, oh yeah, just yeah. Well, why not? No problem. Course, Let's what, book it. What and they, then, what and they next drop one, I'll be everything. Me and Sando versus you and Pierce. Right. Yeah. Just have him on. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I just wanted to emphasize masterclass and some plot stuff there. Just It shows why following with the trope but also subversion just t- ties it so well. Do you want to go on to world building? Yeah. World building, what'd you give that out of five stars? I gave it a three. A flat neutral three. Interesting. Yeah. I gave it just a put mine in there. I give it a four star, so I think it's great. I'm I'm assuming that this can change much later on, but I really didn't... F- feel that the society itself was really alive a great characters plot all the stuff but the history of the empire um just how everything functions like i'm pretty neutral on all of it just you have some good things of, some bad some some yeah but i i wouldn't particularly say the mm. world is good uh, also the magic system i i know he can cook i know he can do it i know the magic system is going to be awesome mm-hmm we were barely given any of it I here. Mean, this I doesn't can't. use any. Right? Yeah. So I'm not really judging the magic system at all. Like it's teased a little bit, but not much. Okay, fair enough. So I'm, I know that that will improve in the next book. Fair I know enough. it, but for this one, I'm pretty neutral on it. Okay. Why do you say it's great? It's that of the categories, it's my it's lower than my characters and my plot and mm-hmm. emotional impact and thought provokingness. Um, it's higher than prose, I'll say that. <laughs> but it's the lower one of those. So I get your point. It wasn't uh, like it wasn't unbelievably realized. Like oh, I could see everything because a lot of it relies on some Roman tropes that you can. Oh, okay, this is generic. This area here and here and here. So I get that. I think that the magic system itself, where although I didn't deeply understand the hard lines to it. 
that no, I didn't know it cut off here. I think the concept and also the execution of will in this book and what it does kind of more for my thought provoking this as well, but how the structure of society works with pyramid structures and how the bottom are seeding to the higher ups to give them enough power. And I don't understand all of the intricacies to that other than the details that are given, such as like the elderly kind of there's elderly pyramids where they're given less important functions because once they die out, it cripples that part of the pyramid in society and they're no longer able to do this. So they have to give the more, uh, you know, the, the retirees get a different pyramid than these. And we're, like you said, in book two, we're going to get the censor from mm -hmm. this and we're going to find out probably a lot more about how those pyramids work and what actually Will does. A lot of the academia portion was talking about how there's a uh, con conditional Will and all, all these elements of we were learning the it's like reading about a magic system rather than seeing it applied. So I yeah. see that a lot where we kind of, it was like we were studying it and not seeing the use because of this is character. We studied some and of it and then kind of, we started studying it and then he moved on like, oh, oh yeah, I got the answers right. And like, well, what was the answer? Like <laughs> there's, there's some theory stuff and we passed over. So I know it's going to be great. It's mm -hmm. just this book. I'm just not giving it that high of a score. Fair enough. Yeah. I'm, I, I still do think it's great because I did enjoy the magic system and I liked the, the Katian Republic. Uh, their, their system as a whole was interesting. And I, I, when they went to Seuss, I liked the little tidbits that we got of more of the culture that even from three, four years ago that we get to see like his, the, the old shop owner or the, mm -hmm. the guy, who, the culinary, the, the chef. Why did, why did it take me that long to say chef? It's going to the end of the episode. You know, we get loopy. <laughs> so the chef character or his old, uh, the servant the, or the, his old tour that was there to show there was still that life and spark in the nation. I couldn't see Seuss. So ge geographically, I don't seem island nation area, island, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Fill in the blank there. But um, I have... Uh, a lot a lot of the questions it led for me so not a lot of answers but i'm questioning about the cataclysm i'm looking at like the, this happened 300 years ago where i'm questioning about the history and i'm very curious and fascinated to where it's going and so it did enough for me to go like i want uh, when i was reading this book was i lost in the world and was i escaping yes i was thoroughly going okay this will system like i'm on board okay what's this about then every time like the pyramid was explained and how the will is seated and how conditional will works i was going like oh what, what's that mean oh okay you didn't give me every answer there give me a little bit not much <laughs> but now i want to see where it goes next so it just kept me really engaged and i do like the it's more conceptually i like it than i do seeing where the hard lines are so yeah. i could i could see myself with the future books if it does even better book two i yeah. could probably lower this one by 0 0.25 0 0.5 but i just really enjoyed it, it I, I was immersed so it didn't give me enough to be really immersed in the world this time but I trust the author. I know it'll get there. Great. Want to go on to pros? Yep. What did you give pros out of five stars? I gave 3.5. I think it was good. Is this our first on the money one? Or did we get... Because I also gave it 3.5. Yeah. Good. Good. Good pros. Good pros. I, I will say, this is the most improvement from his previous series. Like th That the was a wise? thing he was missing in um, the first one uh, from... Lacanus Trilogy. Lacanus Trilogy. His prose needed some work. He yeah. he did he did well, but like I, the first book, let's say his rough. let's say his pro, his read. prose in the previous trilogy was a con. It, it was, and the, here's the thing. The, yes, I I got just, you. Yes, I thought it was cute. It's also cute because you actually made a, you made a pun, in the world. The magic system in. Lacanus is called Khan. Oh, I didn't even know that. With a K. K -A oh, that's even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> you elevated it. <laughs> Man, I got to read that book. Yeah. I got to read series. Okay. But the, so a big problem, a big problem with amateur writers, self-included, basically everyone, is it's hard to do multiple things at the same time. I've talked about this before, but with Lacanus book one, it was very much separated of, okay, here's the plot moment. We're going to talk about plot, and now here's dialogue moment to uh, talk about the characters. And now chunk where we're going to describe world. And it was all so separate. So there was long chunks where it was like just describing things and info dumps. And it's like, all right, come on. Where he does a great job in this book of actually integrating things together. 
And so we're describing the world while we're having a conversation with characters where we learn a little bit about the character's motivation deep down while also seeing more about the world. And so we learn, and then also while doing this, sometimes we're pushing the plot along. So it's mixed together quite well, which is what basically any good published author nowadays is doing. Like that's kind of the bar we got to do. I don't know. That's that's really it. So he he does that here. Um, Can I clarify? Is what well, not mm-hmm. clarify? I think you told me this wasn't the first Lacanus book self published, mm-hmm. and then got picked up by a traditional publisher. Yeah. Okay. So that that's interesting. So he started self publishing and then became yeah a corporate machine. He did. Mm. He sold out. We will never sell here. I sell out here on to the ramble. Um, check out check our link. <laughs> check out our affiliate link on Amazon.com to buy the will of the many. You know how much we make fun of Amazon and put their affiliate link down in the description. Yeah. Oh wow. And you know we make like literally two bucks on that. It's not like we make anything crazy. We could put something else there. We really could. We could do a different thing. Like a smiley. We don't even have to put it down there. Well, no, we could put like uh, there's books.com. There's other sites. Okay, we we'll do. look into that. We'll look uh-huh. into that. Okay. We already not don't do. Uh, audible yeah like we do libro.fm like I'll, I'll promote that stuff that's great i don't like promoting audible not yet the only time it's acceptable to go to audible is when you're picking up dungeon crawler carl because it's the only place it's available and i hate them for doing that to me <laughs> <laughs> but the books are too damn good to refuse yeah basically mm. so the pros uh, i could leave us with some quotes some of the best quotes from the book hit me the top one on goodreads quotes is silence is a statement diago Inaction picks a side. And when those lead to personal benefit, they are complicity. One of the thought-provoking messages that we expanded upon there. My girl, the villainous, the terrorist lady. (laughs) Nervousness means there's a fear to be faced ahead, Diago. The man who is never nervous never does anything hard. The man who is never nervous never grows. I like that a lot. I think that's also the terrorist lady. Is that? It may be. No. I think that's his father. (laughs) Oh. Like a flashback scene, I think. Maybe, maybe you're right. Or I think it's all the terror, all the good you lines. Great, that came all from these terrorist lady. Just to show you how convoluted this book is, each quote could could be from the terrorist or the hierarchy. We don't know. Yeah, but that also <laughs> is a negative on prose. You know what I mean? Of like ha- characters having unique yeah. voice of like a lot of these lines. Many different could have people. been other people, right? Yeah, which is but we're not giving the prose crazy good. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a difference of with Joe Abercrombie. You don't confuse a Glockta quote. Never. Like, That's Glockta's Glockta, and only Glockta could say Glockta things. And it's, <laughs> you know who says what. That's why Sanderson, to me, gets some credit for pros. Like, I know that's a Kaladin quote. I know that's Dalinar. So he gets, he goes from the 3 5 to the 4 for me. <laughs> that's, I love you, Sando. Uh, then here's another one There comes a point in every man's life where he can rail against the unfairness of the world until he loses, or he can do the best in it, remain a victim. Or become a survivor. Yeah, just like how after every video, I survive you. Actually, the next quote is, death is only mean- meaningless if it does not change us, Fist. And I think the death of every episode changes us. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> See you all next time. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>